A Football Life is presented by Chase. Coaching at whatever level is, and playing at whatever level, is a, is a stressful undertaking. To have that success over that amount of time, it's a testament to him and his fortitude. People always love to start, and we always love to finish. We get ready to start school. We get excited. We're going to start school. We're graduating. We're, we're getting excited because we're going to graduate. What is that sustainability in the middle between starting it and finishing it that most people don't have? So he is a measure above normal men. You're going to be a football player when you go Today is the best day of your life. Believe it. He might be the finest quarterback in Purdue in the last 10 years. He is a day like that. That's all I need. Fortunately for me, I didn't lose my life. I didn't lose my job. Football convinced me that life is a team game. Rest of your life. Nobody could ever tell you that you couldn't do it. Good to see everybody again, huh? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's great. How you yeah. doing? I feel good. You yeah. look good. Later on, we're going to do gassers yeah. and a 12-minute run. You know what? You'll be, you'll be in your uh, scooter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is Mr. Perfect, the man who presides over the only unbeaten team in NFL history, a coach who once drove his players to tears, now so obviously delights in their company. Well, one time, Newman... Newman did something, he says, Coach said, Newman, you must be twins, because no one person can be that dark. <laughs> How about the bed check oh, I used yeah. to have on the road? Oh, we were staying in a, uh, a hotel on the road that had an elevator and an elevator operator. So I told the elevator operator that anybody that gets on this elevator after 10 o'clock, which is curfew, get their autograph on this ball. <laughs> So oh. the next day I go into the meeting and I'm flipping this ball around. <laughs> Burke's autograph, Larry Little's autograph was on it. <laughs> you can never be a friend of Coach Shula because he would cut his mother if it meant that the team would, would be better. But after football, uh, we became really good friends and, and I admire him. Their bond is unbreakable even if someday their record is bested. So far, it's lasted for 40 years. Hey, thanks for the night. It's been a great night and it's been a great week. And, uh, you know, we, we're going to enjoy it. And people might think that we celebrate too much, but the hell with them. <laughs> Today, the patriarch of that 72 team is a grandfather who enjoys visits from his children and grandchildren. You look so handsome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me? You talking to me? I'm talking to you. He lives each day like most retirees in Florida, except he owns a popular chain of restaurants that bear his name and sits upon an unbreakable record, 347. People ask me how I coached as long as I coached, 33 years. And I said, you got to win early and often. <laughs> then you've got a chance to stay around. In 33 years as a head coach, Don Shula had only two losing seasons. His granite jaw is a monument, emblematic of a man who's seen and lived the history of the NFL and much of the 20th century. From a young disciple of Paul Brown to a pillar of the National Football League, from the Korean War to the end of the Cold War, Johnny Unitas drops a perfect bomb to Lenny Moore. From Unitas to Marino. Perfectly thrown pass by Dan Marino. Presley to Pearl Jam. I didn't even ask how much it was. I just signed it. From $5,000 contracts to multi-million dollar contracts. The New York Jets are the world champions in a stunning upset. From his greatest disappointment to his greatest triumph. Coach Shulett becomes the all-time winningest coach, breaking the record of the immortal George Hallis. In five decades of football, Shula won in every way imaginable. It's gone! The Dolphins win! The Dolphins win! And lost in memorable fashion. Here's the snowplow. This is unbelievable. The snowplow where the ball is going to be put down so that they can kick a field goal 
What I should have done is thrown myself in front of the snowplow. Shula's career spanned 12 Olympic Games, 10 presidents, and three commissioners. He's won more games than Vince Lombardi, George Allen, and John Madden combined. But what made Shula so good for so long? Excellence is not an act, but a habit. Aristotle said that, and Don Shula lived it. Over time, even his huddles sounded the same. We're kicking off. We gotta have the good hang time on the kick. Let's make sure we're not offside. Don't give up the one-on-one. -on -one. We gotta do the good job on the kickoff, the hang time. Don't give up the one-on-one. -on -one. We gotta cover the kickoff. Good hang time. Don't give up the one-on-one. -on -one. Let's go. The NFL's most consistent winner was born in 1930 in Grand River, Ohio, a small fishing village on Lake Erie. He was taught the values of hard work and faith from his parents, Mary and Dan. Picture of me at age 15. No, I'm a lot younger, <laughs> a lot younger than that. I don't know why they got me dressed like this. They got a gown on me for some reason. Might have been my christening, I guess. At Harvey High School in nearby Painesville, Don earned 11 varsity letters and was voted best body. But one day, that body took a beating at football practice, and he had to explain it to his mother. And I got home and she said, what's that? I said, well, I, got, I was making a tackle and I cut my nose. She said, that's it. No more football for you. <laughs> so the next year, she wouldn't sign the card for me to go out and play. So I secretly forged my parents' name on the card, handed it in, and that's how I got you know, got to play by sophomore year. After graduation, Shula received a scholarship from John Carroll, a small Jesuit university outside of Cleveland. He went on a religious retreat there one summer, and once again, his football career almost came to an end. I thought at that time that the priesthood is something that I would consider. And then I got thinking about not being able to play football, baseball, basketball, and run track. So that took away my desires to become a priest. In 1950, John Carroll faced powerhouse Syracuse, and Shula's life was changed forever. I had a big day rushing. I think I had over 100 yards rushing, and we won the game. And Paul Brown and his whole staff were there scouting Syracuse for pro prospects. So when I had the big day, it got drafted by the Browns. The stage was set for a brilliant interception and return by Don Shula. Shula was a defensive back for seven years in the NFL. He played and learned under Paul Brown in Cleveland, and then became an on-field coach for Weeb Eubank in Baltimore. In 1963, despite being just 33 and younger than some of the Colts players, he convinced Carol Rosenblum he was ready to be a head coach. Nice, Sam. You had that Pick face right in his mustache. Good job. All right, that's it. Low and hard. All right, turn it on now, Jerry. When you get through, turn it on. I think the toughest thing that I had to deal with was standing in front of the group and telling them what my plan was, and then to know that some of the players that were out there were much better players than I ever thought about being. So I had to, you know, win them over. We started out, we had some great licks hit. This is what we want to see. Great by the defense, great by the offense. Shula's resolve was tested early in Baltimore. In the 1964 championship game against his beloved Browns, the Colts were shut out. That was a uh, crushing defeat. And my father did not like to lose. Nobody likes to lose, but he liked it least. Shula was both demanding and deft on the fly. In a 1965 playoff game in Green Bay, with both his quarterbacks injured, Shula gave running back Tom Matty a wristband of plays and a pat on the back. The Colts built a late 10-7 lead, but lost in overtime thanks to a disputed game-tying field goal. 
Chandler kicks it, looks at it, kicks the ground and walks off the field. And Jim Tunney goes like this and says it's good. We almost died. I mean, we could not believe that he did that. Four years later, Shula's Colts had the best record in football. They entered Super Bowl three as 18 point favorites. Shula said, if we lose this game, every great thing we've done is out the window. The whole season is ruined if we get beat by the AFL underdog. That's Snell, has been the outstanding runner so far. He's in there, Snell scores! Intercepted, that's the fourth intercepted. The game is over, the New York Jets are the world champions. They have upset the Baltimore Colts and beat them handily here today. That loss, that's been my biggest disappointment. You never live that one down. It was a bad day to be Don Shula. It was followed by a worse night. One of Shula's favorite players, number 21 Rick Volk, was injured on the game's first series. Volk returned. But in the final minutes, he was knocked out cold on an onside kick. So after the game, we're on the bus. Wives are with the players, and we're heading back to uh, Fort Lauderdale. I'm getting sick on the bus, uh, throwing up into a box that I'm holding on my lap. We finally get back to the room. The doctor comes up to the room with us. He asked him how he felt, and he said, I have a headache, and I feel sick to my stomach. And I remember Dr. Freeman saying, well, we all feel sick to our stomach after that game. And, and then you started with a seizure. I knew exactly what it was, and I sort of just left you be and ran out into the hallway and screamed for help. The doctor comes back in. Coach Shula's there. They keep me from swallowing my tongue by putting a ballpoint pen down my throat. We arrive at the hospital, and Rick's on a stretcher. And there, we come out of the elevator and there's Don Shula there. I sort of come to and I see Coach Shula there and I said, hey coach, I said, are we still going to get our rings? And he said, no Rick, I don't think we're going to get our rings. It says a lot of the type of person that he was, that he was more concerned about the health of his players and their families than he was about the game that just happened. <laughs> Volk recovered and enjoyed a long career. The relationship between Shula and Carol Rosenblum, however, was never the same. The following season was Shula's last in Baltimore. He and Rosenblum wanted to make a change. So did Miami Dolphins owner, Joe Robbie. He thought that Shula might be interested in getting out of Baltimore. And it so happened at the time that Carol Rosenblum was traveling abroad my dad called Steve Rosenblum, his son, and received permission to talk to Shula. Uh, and then, of course, when Carol Rosenblum came back and heard about it, he raised a stink with Pete Rozelle, and the Dolphins had to give up a number one draft choice for tampering, and which was ludicrous. But uh, bottom line is, we got the better of the deal anyway. Coming up. You know, everybody said he was this, he was that. He was possessed. 33 zone? You, you didn't make the thing. Outside Dolphin Stadium, there's a statue commemorating Don Shula's perfect 1972 season. It depicts his ride of a lifetime when he was carried off after Super Bowl VII. Holding him up are offensive lineman Al Jenkins and Hall of Fame linebacker Nick Bonaconti. Honestly, I did not carry the coach off the field. Everybody accuses me of that, and I said, why would I want to put a fat Hungarian guy up on my shoulders after I play 60 minutes of one of the toughest games I've ever had to play in? There's no disagreement as to how bad the Dolphins were when Shula took over. They had won just three games in their last season under head coach George Wilson. Uh, it was a party team, and he referred to it when he got here. He says, I know you guys are used to having parties even when you lose, and we got to change this image. You guys don't know how to win. 
and I'm determined that we are going to teach you how to win. Hold up, hold up. What's wrong with our snap count? Back in a huddle. Let's go. He was the original Don, not just a Don, the Don. He was the head of organized violence, is what he was. Before, when it was too hot, the dolphins went swimming. With Shula, there was no water on the field for seven years. They practiced four times a day, illegal in the NFL now, and lateness wasn't tolerated. A guy was late coming to practice, so the guy climbs over the fence, and he gets in, and, and, and she goes over to Shula, and Shula cuts him right there. And he says, and by the way, same way you came in, go back the same way. It was a fight every day for every one of us, and he never tired. You know, everybody said he was this, he was that. He was possessed. He was like some kind of evil spirit that had endless energy. Charlie, let's go. Let's get something out of the drill. Everything we do is for a reason. The thing that uh, really is one of my coaching philosophies is uh, somehow, some way, get the winning edge in a ball game. That edge would come from hard work and Shula's infamous 12-minute runs after practice. They were a means to an end and the players used any means to try and get out of them. I'm going to tell the truth now. From the time I passed out in practice, about two hours into practice, I started wheeling. I mean, this is the right time. I hit the ground, and the doctor told me, she Larry, there's not a damn thing wrong with you. You got to find something. I said, well, Doc, you see, you do have a slight sinus problem. I said, well, Doc, put that on there. <laughs> I got you. What? I bull you. <laughs> All right, a little late on your read, Don. You're not going to have that much time. 33 zone? You, you didn't make the thing. He's a pusher. He's a guy that picks a goal. He looks at you and figures how far he can push you. Look at him! You can't come up unless he blocks! And he takes you right to that breaking point. Get set! What the hell are you doing? And sometimes a little beyond it. Sanka! As a result, we went undefeated. Shaken up on the play is Greasy. He may have to go out of the ball game. In 1972, Bob Greasy missed nine games. But just like with Tom Matty back in 65, Shula had a plan B. This time, it was old Earl Moore. He sets up. He is filing down the corner. Warfield. Touchdown. In the playoffs, the Dolphins trailed the Pittsburgh Steelers. Earl Morrill, winner of 10 straight games, was struggling. So Shula turned to Greasy. Shula's move paid off. Miami came from behind to win, maintained perfection, and rolled into Super Bowl VII. No team has ever come into the Super Bowl with an unblemished record. No team has ever won 17 games in a row in a professional football season. Miami's shooting for that record today.
Don Shula brought him on to perfection. When you win 17 games without a defeat, that is perfect. The following year, Miami crushed the Vikings in Super Bowl VIII. The Dolphins were 32-2 and two in those two super seasons. Don Shula was high above them all. The NFL's one and only perfect coach. Coming up. What's the call, Dave? The first family of football. Can't wait till we get through this game. It's like to be a Dolphin fan again. Don Shula's drive led to back-to-back -back championships in the 70s, but his singular devotion to football left him oblivious to everything else. I still remember the day Don Johnson for Miami Vice was at the Orange Bowl. I guess it was during the 80s when that was a very popular show, Miami Vice. Yeah, no, I was there. I was there, and uh, Don Johnson came along. It was maybe a Monday night game. So Ed brings him over, and he said, Coach, he said, I got Don Johnson here from Miami Vice, and he wanted to meet you, so I think he's really with, you know, Miami Vice. I said, you know, I want to thank you for what you guys do, and people really don't appreciate how tough a job you got. He's looking at me, you know. I really didn't know who Don Johnson was. Basically, his life was football, family, and faith. And in terms of time consumption, it was primarily football. The other two, he did believe in very strongly, but he was lopsided. He was a lopsided football creature. No one understood this better than Shula's first wife, Dorothy. On our honeymoon, we're out walking on the beach, and. I wanted to check her athletic ability because I had found out she was pregnant. So I just uh, said, let me see your backpedal. I want to see your coordination. So she's on the beach backpedaling, and, and I was giving her movement to see if she had athletic ability that uh, our kids would inherit. We were extremely lucky to have our mom in our lives and raise us the way that she did because my dad was away for you know, half the year. I've gotten so used to it, I don't know another way of life. It's just been exciting and um, sometimes, though, lonely. I remember going out, watching David practice football, thinking, you know, Don would be the one who'd be there waiting for him to finish. Shula's sons learned that the best way to penetrate Dad's world was to become part of it, and David took the first step. He wanted so desperately to be with his dad that he would ride a bicycle or hitchhike or walk or whatever he had to do. And he'd show up at practice. And Shu said, well, if you're going to be here, you're going to do something. And he gave him a chart to chart the plays. What's the call, Dave? You know, I was fortunate and blessed to be able to, you know, grow up around legends of the game. I'll stand around the Don't do a damn thing. Kept stats and worked during the summer and then during games. And I thought that was just the greatest. You got it to Miami, you think got to win. I got to. Why? Yeah, all this way for nothing, you know. No sense in losing now. Father and son. He enjoyed being the ball boy and working himself up, and then went to Dartmouth and played at Dartmouth. It's Stevens, the Shula, nifty cap. And then played one year in the NFL as a punt returner. As Shula hoped, both sons inherited the football gene each playing a season in the NFL. But their future, like their father's, was in coaching. My son Mike, left-handed, went to Alabama, played there, and then he was a coach at Alabama, and now he's with the Carolina Panthers with Cam Newton. You gotta control what you can control. That goes back to the number one rule, you know what I mean? Just gather yourself right here and get ready to go. My three sisters, I'm sure they missed out on a lot that my brother and I were able to take advantage of because we could go to work with them. When one of the Dolphins' coaches left midseason to take another job, Coach Shula turned to David, his 23-year-old son. In 1982, David became the youngest assistant coach in the NFL. Complaints of nepotism soon followed. It had to be tough on Dave. If you, people think you're only there because of your last name, David had to prove himself. How's that? Gives me a chance to show my catching ability. <laughs> I think he handled it really well. You know, he had Duper and Clayton, myself. He was just maybe a couple years older than us um, and stepped right in there the coach. Together, father and son conquered opponents and body odor. Hey, Old Spice Dick, 
When did you switch deodorant, son? When I found out Old Spice is 24 hours strong, Dad. 24 hours? Who needs a deodorant to last 24 hours? We do, Coach. It's going to be a long day. Whether they win or lose, the Dolphins have become a close-knit football team, bearing the Shula signature now more than ever before. One of the happiest periods in Shula's life was followed by the darkest. In the late 80s, Dorothy was stricken with breast cancer, and the years-long battle had taken its toll. He's always, you know, held his emotions pretty close, and um, that was strained uh, to the max uh, and broken toward the end. How's Dorothy doing? Oh, she's struggling. Uh -huh. just, uh, you see, it just yeah. tears you apart. I mean, she's just getting weaker and weaker. And, uh -huh. but she's fighting it. Yeah. Yeah. I know that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, well. yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. just so tough, that the disease is breast cancer. I think if you get by five years, then you've got a chance to, to make it. But uh, she never got, she got, I think, third or fourth year when the disease took over, and, uh, and uh, she died. Dorothy didn't get the chance to see Don's next milestone, or to see David, now a head coach in Cincinnati, face Don in the first father-son matchup in NFL history. How you hanging, man? I'm hanging. Can't wait till we get through this game so I can be a Dolphin fan again. I don't think I've ever told anybody. I was, I was pulling for Dave. You know, he was trying to turn the corner there. Dave Schillen, his third year, he's trying to turn the Bengals around. And he said, I'm looking forward not only to matching up against my father tonight, but against the greatest coach in the history of the NFL. It's a tough deal, you know, father coaching against son. But, I, you know, I had to win for my team and my coaches and players. I think we were ahead at halftime. And they came back and beat us pretty good in the second half. Takes the snap. He's looking. Throws it to the end zone. Complete touchdown, Mark Ingram. Daddy Shula knows this. And then afterwards, it got a little emotional, you know, because I, I was struggling and didn't get it. And, you know, I needed it a lot more than he needed it for his career. <laughs> All right. Okay. Good luck the rest of you. Thank you. But things don't go that way. He had the better hand and coached a better game and came out the winner. That result couldn't spoil a lifetime of memories for a football family. But it did serve as a reminder. Chula would pull no punches on the road to 347. Every year, the National Football League comes up with some rules changes. This year, the most important changes concern pass coverage and the interaction between receivers and defenders. The game has changed dramatically since Don Shula first roamed the sidelines. That evolution can be traced back to changes that Shula helped institute as a member of the NFL's competition committee. You know, I felt that all the things that we were doing were things that were good for the game, to open the game up, to make it more exciting, you know, that was our whole emphasis on the committee. Spinoff is an advanced National Football League. The rules they made all enhanced the scoring and the number of big plays per game. Opponents like Minnesota's Bud Grant thought that committee chairmanship awarded Shula an unfair advantage. You see that? You gotta call it! And I'm not gonna say that uh, they were intimidated by him, but um, let's just say at times I think he got some calls going his way. Hey! He can't push off like that! But when Shula pushed the boundaries, he learned he wasn't exempt from the same rules he helped to create. We were absolutely shocked to learn of your actions in the game last Sunday. While the language attributed to you was bad enough, the physical act of grabbing headlinesman Bruce Phillips's arm was extremely serious. A personal fine in the amount of a thousand is being assessed. I never did learn how to act. He always looked for an edge, but he would never cheat. He hated it when he heard rumors of other teams maybe cheating, but he was about integrity and winning the right way. Once in Oakland, we went in and used their locker room because the other locker room, something was going on the day before the game. I'm in a locker that belongs to an Oakland Raider. I open it. And there's the game plan. There's what they're going to do to try to defeat us tomorrow. I hand it to Monty Clark, who's our offensive line coach. He's walking by. I said, Monty, look at this. Give this to Coach Shula. The following day, 
Miami lost to Oakland. I see Monty a week later. I said, Monty, what was the deal? You know, we ended up losing with the Raiders. What, you know, what's the deal? You didn't give... So Coach Shula said, throw it away. He said, throw it away. When you've got their stuff and you know what to do, that's cheating. Shula won't cheat. He's got integrity. But abiding by Shula's rules wasn't always easy for a free spirit like Mercury Morris. He was always saying or doing something controversial. And I always had to remind him that I was the boss. I was the head coach. I think this is one of the times that he's trying to tell me that he's the boss. And that didn't work. <laughs> Their relationship was severely tested during a difficult 1974 season. Down to Mercury Morris is Anthony. You uh, had him out with a bad ankle and put him back in again. I didn't put him back into the ball game until I was assured by the trainer and the doctor that there wasn't anything seriously wrong with the ankle. Don and I had been at odds because I was hurt. And when you're hurt, your frustration level and your wick is very short. So we, we clashed at that particular time. Tell them about the time you were suspended and I passed you going in the door and you were walking out. Were you suspended? What are you talking about? Well, I walked out and then you sent me a telegram the next day saying, you're fired. <laughs> you're out of the NFL. <laughs> he and I were like arch enemies, butting heads all the time. Get in here. And over the last 20, 25 years, he's been like a father to me. Shula was far more flexible when it came to strategy. In the early 70s, it was blood and thunder with Zonka and Jim Kick. It's Zonka straight up the middle, and he's got the But after those two left for the WFL, Shula won games on the arm of Bob Greasy. He was voted coach of the decade. In the early 80s, Shula returned to a run-first offense while rotating quarterbacks. The Dolphins went to the Super Bowl. The Dolphins select quarterback Dan Marino of Pittsburgh. Then, after Dan Marino fell in his lap, Shula changed again. He engineered a record-breaking passing attack in 1984 on the way to another Super Bowl, Shula's sixth. People who are old, people who are formed, people who are successful, they usually aren't willing to change like that. You didn't have time on Freddie there? That's just a sign of a great football coach that just knows to adjust to the people he has. This adaptability is what attracted Irving Fryer to the Dolphins. He came over in a 1993 trade. If I had to think about a biblical character that I could synonymize Coach Shula with, it would be Moses. Um, and, and that's because he set me free. <laughs> We had a certain way of doing things in New England. It was very systemic. You had to straight line, get up the field, no creativity allowed in the routes. Now he released me, and I was free because I was able to use imagination. I was able to use my athletic ability. I was able to use my speed. He's got Fryer wide open. My career took off. It is caught by Fryer. Yes! They get it in. Good job. Me as a person took off because of my experience with Coach Shula. He was Moses to me. He set me free. Give Shula a talent like Friars, he'd free it. Give him an arm like Marino's, he'd throw it. Give him a practice field that was under construction, he'd use a parking garage. We're at the Marriott, I think it was a Marriott, at the airport at LAX. He goes, is there a parking lot here? And, and our hotel rep says, yeah, we got like a four-level parking lot in the back. Shula says, we'll practice here. We have receivers going out, running for a route, and they're jumping over those little things that you pull your car in so you don't hit something. Coaches would be talking, and you'd hear, you know, the plane coming in from LAX. Yeah, we would do things like that. I'd rather have the players doing a walkthrough than sitting in a meeting half falling asleep. So uh, any time that I could find a facility big enough, I called a walkthrough. This is insanity. Who practices in a parking lot? Shula. So what happens the next day? Fumble on the play, Dolphins pick it up. We'll run it in for a touchdown. We beat the Raiders for the first time ever in California during the regular season. It was the parking lot. It was Don Shula. Coming up. If you had something on your resume that had never been done in sports, damn straight you would pop champagne every year to celebrate. <laughs> That's a 
picture of me giving Raymond Floyd some pointers on the golf swing. <laughs> Raymond Floyd is one of the best golfers of all time. You know, he's won all of the big tournaments. Maria, right here. And his late wife, Maria, is the one that introduced my wife, Marianne, and I. We met New Year's Day at Raymond and Maria Floyd's house, and I was blown away with his confidence because I actually showed up with a date, and he <laughs> and he ignored my date, and, and before he left, he said, I'd really like to call you sometime. You could just sense it, how he felt about her. When she came around and he was around the team, it was no longer about the team, it was about her. Don had told me, Marianne, I want to take you places you've never been. And I was pretty excited about that, but he took me to Buffalo. He took me to Foxborough. He took me to the Combine. <laughs> I cherish being with him. I cherish his presence next to me. We have a beautiful, beautiful life together. In November of 2012, Don and Marianne watched the last undefeated team fall. A month later, the Shulas hosted a 40th year reunion for the NFL's only perfect team. Coach and I both have been so excited all week that you guys are coming. He's still like beside himself. He's so happy. Well, it's like great. having, you know, it's like having us all, all his children back. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Merck. Hey, Nikki. Darrow. Hey, Mom. <laughs> How you doing, Coach? How you doing? It's a tradition they hold every 10 years. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest football team ever put together. And will continue to hold as long as the record lasts. Zonk is the, the tall one, right? Yes. Next to Bob Reese? Right there, yeah. He's the farthest one to the left shaking hands. The left, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you think about 40 years, it was actually 50 years before that, and then 40 years since that's happened. So it's been about 100 years with only one team doing it. So I think it tells you a little bit about how tough it was to do. So that's why occasionally we get together and toast each other about that great accomplishment. Here's the 40 years, and here's the 40 more. It's interesting the way that's looked at around the country as a bunch of bitter old men hanging on to a piece of their past in a way that's unbecoming or small. But if you had something on your resume that had never been done in sports, damn straight you would pop champagne every year to celebrate. Perfection is good, right? Perfection is good. Yeah. At heart, Don Shula is very protective of the record. In 1985, his own Dolphins embarrassed the unbeaten Bears, handing the eventual Super Bowl champions their only loss. Moore takes it in. What a victory for the Dolphins. Bears will not go undefeated. That's what this whole thing, that's why we're sitting here talking about this 40 years after the fact. Nobody else can friggin' do it. On November 14th, 1993, Don Shula set out to do what many thought could not be done surpassed George Hallis's all-time record for wins. I picked up the paper that morning, and I saw where Coach Shula was going for the record. And I called a friend of mine. I said, I don't know if you're interested, but I'm, I'm getting on a train, and I'm going to Philly. I want to see this. I want to be there when he, when he breaks the record. I just have so much respect for him. We need a drive. we got to put it together. we got to start running with the ball, pass protecting, making plays. <laughs> The record would not come easy. Dan Marino was already lost for the season. Backup Scott Mitchell built a slim lead. Then he went down. But as he always had, Shula stayed the course. Wouldn't it be a delicious touch of irony if Doug Peterson is able to pull out the record win for Don Shula, who over the years has had such great performances from backup quarterbacks? Earl Morrill, even Tom Maddy at one time filled in a quarterback. Now Doug Peterson at the helm as he tries to break the record. What a special man and what a special moment. The man of the moment, the man of all time in the NFL. This is number 325, and it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Coach Shula being mobbed as he becomes the all-time winningest coach in the history of the National Football League. The game ends, and, and I'm, I go right out there. 
I put my arms around the guy and give him a big hug and say, Coach, you're the greatest. You're the greatest coach. You're the greatest human being. And if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be nearly as successful. I've only had two rides in my life as a coach. One was after the Super Bowl, 17-0, and the other one was being carried off the field in Philadelphia after breaking Coach Hallis's record. So those are the two rides that, that I'm always going to remember. I remember how excited I was, and I ran into the locker room without thinking, and some of the players weren't prepared for that. <laughs> hey, honey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> football like that at such a high level for so long. It's really amazing. I don't think burnout ever, ever even entered his mind. Don Shula attacked every season like the last, but there were no more trips to the Super Bowl, and he came under fire for his inability to fix the team's chronic weaknesses. Uh, we never had a running game. We got to have it on that 14 and 15 now. We need running. The defense was suspect. I mean, we really had to win games 45-41. I just remember in South Florida in 95, you know, people just sort of wanting Don Shula out, which was, you know, blasphemy. I mean, we have an expressway in South Florida named after Don Shula. He helped put sports on the map in this area. At the end, though, fans kept getting more and more impatient. The criticisms were not uncommon for an aging coach. Don Shula was too old. The game had passed him by. The taskmaster had gotten soft. Let me say this, because I played for Don Shula his last year as a head coach, and there was nothing soft. Believe me, there was nothing soft about Don Shula. You know, I was a little stubborn feeling that I could still do it. My last year was 9-7. and seven. Some coaches' standards, that's not bad. That's pretty good. But uh, other people felt that I had had enough and that uh, I should retire. And that was a decision that, that I finally arrived at. Needless to say, uh, this week has, has been the most difficult. This is the, the day that, that, that uh, you know, you never thought was going to happen. I think he found it hurtful. I think that he looked around and felt that there wasn't enough appreciation for how hard it was to win in that league and how good he was at his job. And in retrospect, he's right. The Dolphins have never been as good as they were under Don Shula. Don Shula retired with 347 wins. The closest active coach to that mark is Bill Belichick, who would have to average 10 wins a year over the next 15 seasons to pass Shula. He may be underrated. When's the last time Don Shula's name was mentioned when you say, who's the greatest coach in football? They mentioned Lombardi, they mentioned Walsh, they mentioned Hallis. Who's won more games? Who's the coach of the only undefeated team in history? Who won with a running game? Who won with a passing game? He's the greatest winner the greatest game has ever seen. On behalf of the 72 team, I'd like to thank Coach Shula. Here, 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 here. Here, here. For those of us that aren't here with us, we salute them, we remember them. In the next five or ten years, perhaps some of us won't be around. But the record remains. Don Shula was a regular guy. He was a meat and potatoes guy, a mill hunky from Ohio. And the work ethic that this guy gave to us is part of how I live right now. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. You believed in me. Thank you for that. Thanks for teaching me. All I know about pro football. Uh, I love you. A lot of good memories. They don't make them like that anymore. They don't make them like that anymore. The integrity, the drive, his ability to persevere. His life is an example to all of us.